Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Okay, I think we could start. Tough class tonight. Uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Everyone says if I say that, it's going to be good. Nope. <laughs> uh, so the first thing I want to say uh, is this is packed with Christology. If you're new to Christianity, uh, Christology um, is the understanding of Christ, uh, his role in the world, why it's so powerful. This is packed with Christology. It's packed with Trinitarian understanding. It's one of those sections where you don't know until you hear the early church fathers speaking about it. You think you just read that, okay, good, you know, he's not judging me, but there's judgment still, and, you know, you don't know what you're hearing. But then when you, when you hear the, the church fathers speak, you realize every sentence is packed with profound meaning as usual, all the time. And this is about as rich as it's possible to get. It just couldn't get richer than this. So much here. Um, th so the first thing I want to say is, so Jesus says, if you see him, you have seen the Father. If you believe in him, then you believe in the Father. And this is because of Jesus' identity with God. So in Christianity, uh, the disciples experienced Christ, there was no category within the Jewish tradition to understand him. It was a completely new thing. And there was just nothing to compare it to to gain understanding. So the disciples, they're experiencing this guy, Jesus. They think he's the Messiah, right? Just uh, an enlightened man Who's, who's coming to, you know, set up a military rule, take over the world and teach them how to be holy. This is what they think. But as they spend time with him, he starts saying things. He starts saying a lot of things about himself. He starts saying things that if you say them in that time period, you should be stoned to death for saying them. And, and I... I don't know if it if it if he did present it in the way that it's presented in the gospels it had to be doubly frustrating and confusing to the disciples because he doesn't seem to make a very big deal out of it he just says these things that casually it seems maybe with i mean if jesus is talking there's gravity but he doesn't say, oh, hold on, guys, I know you're going to freak out, but let me, let me explain. He doesn't do it. He says these things that only God can say, and that if you say them, you will be stoned to death for saying them. And he, he does it, if you pay attention in the Gospels, he does it very slowly. He just slowly introduces this understanding of who he is. So, so the Jews' understanding of God is 
profoundly different than the pagan understanding of God. So for the pagans, there are many gods. And this God came from this God, and this God came from this God, and this God came from this God. And there's a hierarchy of gods that goes back, 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 back. Each having power and authority over some dimension of life, some area of the universe, let's say. That's the pagan understanding of God. And I don't remember well now, but I just did a deep dive into sort of the kind of pagan theology that existed at the time of Jesus. And it goes back to forces. It turns out that most powerful God, whose name I can't now remember, um, comes way before, like, say, Zeus, right? Or uh, Hercules or something. Like, that's half God, half man. It, 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 there are these powers. So what you have to understand about Jewish theology and Jewish thinking is that the God that they understand, the God that they worship, the God that called them in the desert that began to tap on their shoulders was the God that wasn't made by any other God. The God whose existence, the philosophers say, is a necessity. And, and I hope you could sit with that for about 10 hours. The God whose existence is a necessity. See, any God that was made by another God is unnecessary. But the God who existed, who was not made by something else. See, the, 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 the pagan problem is an infinite regress. Well, who made your God? Well, a different God. Well, who made that God? Another God. Yeah, okay, that doesn't answer the question. What's the one that started it all that was made by nothing? What is that? That's what started tapping on the, the Semitic people's shoulder. The God that was unmade. And at the time, they were worshiping the God of war, the God of thunder, the God of rain, whatever. They were worshiping small letter G gods. But at some point, God, this uh, you have to think of it too in, in terms of spiritual evolution. At some point, humanity evolved to a place where they could conceive of a power, a, a force that was not made by something. Who, whose own self contains being, who is itself being. And you have to understand that to understand what, how radical what Jesus starts to say is. If he was saying, look, I'm God because God made me God, that would just be a heresy in the Jewish tradition, but it would have nothing, it's not stonable. They would just say, go with the pagans then, go with the Greeks. You're no longer a Jew. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying in many different ways throughout all the scripture, that if you have seen me, you've seen God because I am God. I am the incarnation of the God who is unmade. This is ultimately why the Jews reject him. Ultimately and why they convinced the Romans to, to crucify him. Because he's speaking blasphemy. So that's Christology. So when Jesus says, if you have seen me, you've seen God, he's not saying, I'm a God that God made. He's saying, I am the God who made the universe, and I have chosen to incarnate into this world in order to save you. And this is profound. I mean, this is the core of Christian teaching. Um, in the early days, there were all these heresies. People would say, well, you know, the Gnostics came and said, well, really, he isn't God. He's just one of the many gods. Then others would say, no, 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 no. He's, he's a human who became so powerful, he became like God. And others would say, the main heresy, by the way, you would think, if you come from the New Age like me, you would think that the main heresy was, you know, he wasn't really God, but people just mistook him for God, or he, he kind of like became powerful like a God. But actually, the main heresy that had to be squashed by Christianity is that he wasn't human at all, that he only pretended to be human, that God took form, 
but took form as if like a, an actor took on a role and played the role of human. The main heresy that had to be squashed was to uh, keep people from pushing out his humanity. Think of that. That's You would think now later, oh no, there's all these other ideas later that have very little bearing to the early church. So, so okay, so God literally became a human being. God noticed our suffering. God noticed humanity's pain and sorrow. And God wanted to participate in it with us to redeem us, to change us. So God became human. This is Jesus. This is who the disciples begin to see as standing before them. The God who created all worlds, the God who created all universes, that God, the God who before that God, there was nothing else. The uncreated God. The uncreated God. The God who was made by no one. That God, Jesus said, I am standing before you. I am standing before you. And that's, that's either true, or it's the rantings of an insane man who must be put to death. This is what Jesus presents to his disciples slowly over time, who are Jews, who have no category for this, and whose understanding of the Messiah did not include this, and who had to be broken and opened to this message. So that, that's, that's right there in the scriptures, packed with meaning. But there's more. <laughs> there's so much more. So God, like God, the one you sometimes are afraid to turn to and you think you're in trouble with, God says, I did not come into the world to judge it, but to save it. And that is a profound revelation that I think people still struggle with today. And, and I think the Christian tradition has a difficult time. I know that I struggle in trying to sort of preach this message if you if you underemphasize sin too much, you end up where with the early Christian heretics who said, "Okay, if I'm forgiven for anything I do, let's party." <laughs> and they just like you know start literally, honestly, genuinely, they started having orgies. Like of course you know the guys are the ones thinking of that, not the women. Like first thing, guys, like okay, if there's no sin at all, if, like I can't get in trouble if I'm totally forgiven. For sure, I want to have orgies. <laughs> that's, that's guys. And that actually happened. Heretical groups of Christians went down that road. And, and like, don't think, well, we're so enlightened today, that would never happen, because it's already happening. Like, every Friday in Salt Lake City, that's happening. So, no, it, 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 we haven't transcended this. So Christianity is the toughest job in the world. You can't say there's no sin. You can't say there's no right and wrong, or people lose their minds. Because there is right and wrong. Because there are actions I can take that will harm another and set them back. So that's, you can't get around that. But that's the small wheel. That's the small wheel. It's a Grateful Dead lyric. Small wheel turns by the fire and rod. Big wheel turns by the grace of God. So that's the small wheel. Yes, there's right and wrong, and I can screw up, and I can harm others, and I can harm myself, and it matters that I sin. But Jesus here says something staggering. God itself came into the world not to judge the world, but to save it. That is profound. So you have to know now, when you turn to Christ, you're turning to someone who came to save you from pain and sorrow and suffering. And that any time you deal with Christ, no matter what face he presents you, of the many faces he can present, his intention, his primary intention, is to save you from suffering. That's Jesus. And he says, look, and I won't judge you, but, it, but, if, 
But if you are judged, it's the word that will judge you. So how, how can we make sense of that? Here's my best analogy. Jesus says, Clint, we're climbing that mountain. And listen, man, I know you never want to wear shoes. And I get it. You're a freaking weirdo. <laughs> you won't wear shoes. And I get it. You don't have to wear shoes, but you better bring some shoes, man. There's this part at the end where it's pure rock and the rock is, is obsidian and it's broken and it's sharp and you're just simply going to need shoes. And I know you don't like wearing them, just bring them, just pack them, but you've got to bring them. And if I say, ah, I don't wear shoes, man. I do my own thing. I'm, I, I'm really attached to this not wearing shoes thing. That's fine for a big part of the trip. There are parts of the trip where all of a sudden now the word he spoke you have to think of it not in terms of you're in trouble with God. It's not, you're not in trouble. It's that there is a fact of the way things work. There are things that hurt you. There just are. And it's, you're not in trouble for it. He's just saying, do this, don't do this. And if you do this, you're not in trouble, but you're, you're going to cut your feet to shreds. You're not going to make it. That's the way you have to look at if if, God, if Jesus says, I don't judge, but the word will judge in the end. He's, you have to think, he's not just some guy, you know, you, you have to get rid of this notion he's some guy. This is God talking. So that means that there's just a certain way the world was made. And some things work and some things don't. And it's, and it's, if there's something that is wrong to do, it is because you or others will be harmed by that thing. That's it. It's because you or others will be harmed by that thing. If, if, if God prohibits something, it's, it's, like, it's like, it's not because he's embarrassed you're having sex. <laughs> like, first God invented sex, now he's embarrassed by it? That's weird. Like, if you think that through, that what, what could God possibly be embarrassed of? God made the parts. So that doesn't make sense at all. So if there's prohibitions on something, there's, it's, it's to preserve the good of the thing. The beauty, the sacredness, the holiness of the thing, not to keep you from having pleasure. Right? It's, so it's, it's so much, and, and, and Christianity struggles because it's not easy. It's, it's like uh, to get someone to understand sin accurately takes a number of years. Not a number of conversations, a number of years. If you tell someone something is wrong that they're doing, they spin out, feel guilty, want to reject the idea of it. it, it all because it's not so easy to get someone to see right and wrong and true and false without us making it personal and about us and condemning ourselves. So it's not easy. And then there's lazy teachers who just think, well, that's a lot of conversations. Eh, I'm not interested. I don't want to spend 15 hours over the next four years helping free someone from a false understanding of sin. That means I got to do a lot of work. There's like a lot of people in the parish. That, they start doing the calculating thing. I, I, I don't want to spend those hours, man. I got a football game on Sunday. I got things to do. So then just condemn it. It's just bad. Don't do it. It's bad. That's the lazy way. Don't do it. It's bad. But to actually get someone to understand sin and judgment and what, how it is that Jesus doesn't judge and yet you're still judged in the end by the word itself. To get someone to have that understanding takes time. It takes time. Lots of time. And, and some of you know have come from religion that taught it the other way. It can take a number of years to undo the, the wrong understanding. What we say to come to an adult understanding of sin. An adult understanding of sin. It, 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 sin harms others. I don't want to partake in something that harms others because it harms others. So when God says, don't do this and don't do this and do this, 
is to protect people from being harmed. That's why. It's always to preserve love. It's always to preserve our happiness. Always. It, it, 100% of the time. It's to preserve our happiness and our trust among one another. You know, all the rules don't bust over your, you know, your neighbor's wife or husband. It's like, yeah, I mean, if we're going to have any trust at all in the world, we better have that as a foundation. Or no one can trust anyone. And if it's going to be don't lie, well, why? Well, who cares if I lie? But then again, think, think of us, the country, spitting out. I, I don't do politics, so I don't care what side you're on. I don't even care. Just pick a side. Pick your own side. Pick any side. Throw a dart anywhere <laughs> in politics, and you hit a hypocrite and a liar. <laughs> and you hit mistrust. No one believes anyone anymore. But you know why? Because everyone lies. So now we're starting to see what happens when people lie too much. Then no one believes anyone on anything. And that creates great disorder. People start thinking, look, I'm just going to trust my gut. And it's like, great, but that works about, if you have a really clean, intuitive system, you know, you, work, you get 60% of the time you're getting it right. And 40% of the time you're getting it wrong. So you see, so that's the thing about sin. That's the thing about it. So Jesus says, I did not come to judge you. I came to save you. But if I'm going to save you, you got to trust me when I say wear shoes. Just wear some shoes. Even if it gets in the way of your ideas of freedom, how the free spirit you are. You know, I don't think I wore shoes all winter. I, I don't think I did. I don't wear them to take us to school. I don't wear them to walk through the snow out here. You might think that's terrible, but it's just, it's like three times and your feet don't get cold anymore. The first three times you're like, this is terrible. <laughs> but after three times, your feet don't get cold. So I don't need shoes. But Jesus says, wear them, man. It's kind of like my dad. Clint, at least just put them in your trunk, just in case you break down. And I thought, you know, that's smart. <laughs> I'll just put them in the trunk. That's Jesus. So, so hear that when you hear, there's like, oh, I'm not judged, but I'm judged. You're, you're not judged, man. This is a guy saying, hey, man, I want to be with you at the top of the mountain. I want to stand with you in the glory of infinite love. This is where I'm taking you. And I'm just saying, here's what you need to make it. Here's all you need to make it. All the way at the top with me. Where I am, you will be. I came so that my joy might be made complete in you. My peace I give you. My peace I bring. So Jesus is God incarnate and he makes God more accessible, gives you a form and a name that you can call upon and center on in your consciousness and someone you can enter into relationship with. And when he sees you, his consciousness is light. Before God takes form, God is light. Not the light of this world, but it is light. Jesus Christ is light incarnate. And when he sees you, when he looks upon you, you no longer walk in darkness, but you walk in the light. You don't stumble. And, and I want to say caveat, you just start to stumble less. Or maybe since Jesus is an eternal being, maybe he just sees it, sees it all as one thing. You either stumble into disintegration or you walk into life. It's so probably coming from there. He knows you're going to stumble. He knows you're going to cheat on him all the time. He knows that. He knows you're going to mess up all the time. He knows that. But he doesn't, that's not what he means by stumble. I guess from his, it's more existential. It's either you stumble and fail to come into eternal life or you don't stumble and you come to eternal life. 
And when he sees you, you are different because he sees you. You are changed by his vision. Because his vision is light. And his vision is true. But there's a, there's a caveat to that, which is that you, he's not mean, and he's not a bully, and he's not pushy. So you have to say, yeah, I, I gave you permission to see me. I give you permission to see me. I give you permission to change me. And if you say that, then it begins to happen. And it's, 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 this is all entirely beyond activity. This is him just gazing upon you. Now you're different. You begin to change from his look. That's it. He sees you, you change. But if you see him as an enlightened man, you reduce profoundly the power he has to change you with. It's the same as if you, if you say, no, I won't let you change me. Jesus, is, that I, Jesus says, then I'm, I'll get off your back. I mean, there's a little secret thing God still does for everybody, no matter what. But this Jesus thing is different. So you say, no, I won't let you save me. Okay, I don't want to push you around. I honor you and respect you. I love you. I'm not going to bully you. So if you say, I'm not allowed in, I'm not allowed in. Then you say, yes, I'll let you in. So, so you see, if you say, I won't let you in, way less power. Just this one, this power that you can't avoid because if God didn't hold you into existence, you would cease to exist. You don't even have your own existence. So like God's not leaving no matter what. But if you say, get out, get out, Jesus, no way, that's it. Okay. I'll keep knocking every once in a while, but I'm not going to pester you. I might pester you a little. But if you say, okay, Jesus, I let you in, but you think of him as an enlightened man, then that's all you get. You get the blessings of an enlightened man. That's what you get. And that's great. Jesus is on fire. He is a man. Jesus is fully human and fully God. That's what they couldn't work out in the early church. Well, maybe just human, maybe just God, maybe just a demigod, not the God, but one of the gods. Or, you know, we, we, they tried to work this out. They hammered it out. They argued. But the thing is, no explanation fit. Because if you take everything Jesus says, it starts to exclude each one of those ideas. But if you take them all together, what you come up with is fully human and fully God. That's what you come up with. And they just couldn't conceive of it. It's like... Part, you know, quantum physics helps. Now we know it's like it's a particle and a wave, and it's kind of both. And then when you set an experiment, it shows up here, but it's really not there. But as soon as you look, it's there. Now we have some way to conceive of fully human, fully God. But back then, that was weird. And it took them a while to come up with that language, that understanding of it. So, so, so then, okay, uh, he's an enlightened man. Uh, uh, Jesus, you're my guru. And this is what I had in the New Age. You're my guru. And there's power, man. Jesus is a guru. I mean, he's on fire. So there's power there for sure. And there's plenty of people I know tripping on Jesus that way. They got plenty of power because Jesus is for sure a guru. For sure. I mean, they don't have that language in Judaism, but it's the same station. Well, but then some people said, yeah, no, he's not just a guru. He's an avatar. So now it's like the guru of gurus, you know, the, one of the seven or something. Yes. And you opened up to that and there's more power. But then you could turn to the New Testament, which is the last place I looked for finding him, uh, which is funny because it's the only document we have that isn't made up, that we know for sure isn't made up. Um, we, here's what we know. Here's what atheist scholars say about the New Testament. They say it can't be true. There's no God. <laughs> I mean, it's obviously he's not true. But here's what atheist scholars say, the vast majority, by overwhelming consensus. It's not true, but they really believed it. They really believed it. They experienced Jesus and something about him 
changed them so much that they believed this was true about him. This is what consensus scholarship says about the New Testament. It's not true. uh, Atheist scholarship is not true. It's not true. But they're not lying when they say it. They're sincere. This is consensus scholarship from atheism. So then if you say, okay, maybe, maybe, because I came from the New Age, so that's where it ended for me, Avatar. And even the Avatar, put him under Buddha. For me, it was always like, look, if Buddha and Jesus both hit the planet on different islands, I know where I'm going. And it wouldn't be, I wouldn't have to debate. I know where I'm going, I'm going to Jesus. I used to say that all the time in the New Age. It's like, I get they're both on fire, but I'm going to Jesus. That was my thing. So that's where I came from with the New Age, but then Christianity started dropping these bombs on me, saying, no, it's actually God incarnate. And that, I just, I had no category for that. That There was no category in my Hindu training, my Buddhist training, my New Age training for that. That was something different. It's a different kind of power. It's a different kind of authority. Savior. Someone who has the kind of authority over my soul that a person has over a chair they make. Hmm. I'm God's design. Then you're God's design. That's God's good creation. So, I'm thinking if you're new and you don't know this, don't, don't struggle with it, don't accept it, don't do anything with it, but just, just try to hear this message. Jesus Christ has the power and the authority to take you from where you are now, no matter where that is, it could be nearly in hell. That's how I started. At the brink of insanity is where I started. Profound mental illness is where I started. Jesus can take you from there all the way to the top of the mountain, standing in union with God, sharing in God's consciousness and love and power and glory. God, Jesus can take you from wherever you are now to there. And that's what salvation is. Salvation is the way in which Jesus takes you from wherever you are into profound love. And we know the stages of this. Christianity is what they call a bona fide system. They actually know what they're doing. They can actually reproduce sainthood. (laughs) Um, When con men start religions, you don't find... uh, what you don't find when con men and women start religions are groups of people for generations afterward producing lots of saints. You just don't find that. You, you find some spirituality in those groups, for sure, but not sainthood. Sainthood is very high, and it's super rare. And only a few systems on the planet can reproduce it successfully. Those are called bona fide systems. Christianity is bona fide. That means you can open up books with 600 pages written on all the stages on the way to union. Like the psychological changes that happen as you go in, they know what they're doing. That's Jesus. Jesus has that. There's stages you will go through that will take you all the way into union. And what union looks like, we know. It's not a mystery. We know. It's testable. It's reproducible. That's the thing. And I, and I hope it doesn't sound so the way I'm saying it. I hope it doesn't sound cold. It's just such a fact. It's a fact. The monk that I worked with said, Clint, this works just fine. It's just that no one has tried it. I said, what about all the monks here in the monastery? Are they all as prayerful as you? And he said, no. No. There's a thing within us that won't go or doesn't want to go it we we're busy 
That's why Jesus invites all the rich and powerful and they don't come and then in all the parables. Then eventually he says, I'll just go out and get all the homeless people because they're not too busy to come. <laughs> all the broken, the wounded, the ones at the end of their rope, they'll say yes. The people with it all together, they're too busy. They've got too much going on. thing I want to say, it's really important, depending on where you come from, if you come from some traditions, it's, it's almost entirely Jesus' work that is done in the soul. It, it, it's like works, works are not first, and they are never first. It's, it's, it's like if I've got to stop, I, I don't watch porn. I mean, I've watched it, but I don't. But if I did, let's say I was back in that stage where I did, it, it's not like this. If it was this way, humanity would never be saved. Clinton, stop watching porn, and then you'll be worthy to have a relationship with me. Let me know when you're done, then we can start. If, if that's the way salvation worked, with porn and drugs and addiction and anger and selfishness and greed, and you name them. If that's the way it worked, depression, you, whatever it is, you name it. Uh, mine was depression, and I was violent. Um, if, if it's first Clinton, stop that, then come to me, then, then it's false religion, for sure. Then that's false religion. That's the antithesis, it's the antichrist of everything he taught. It's not that. It's, at first it's, hey man, I see you suffering over there, <laughs> and I love you. And if you would just say yes to me starting to pull you out of that place, I will pull you out. And you say, oh, but I, I'm, I, you say that, but I'm, you know, I'm definitely going to sink into depression tonight anyway, and I'm so mad at you, and I'm pissed at her, and... You know, I, I mean, I'm just, I, I'm not ready. And Jesus says, listen, man, I have you. I have you. It, I will pull you in. I will raise you up there. I will grab you with my hand and pull you out of this place. If just you say you will let me. That's salvation. Then it pulls you somewhere and you think, ah, yeah, I mean, I used to get depressed and I don't anymore. And it's like, right, because first God saved you. Then depression fell away. Not first give that up before you're worthy to be touched by me. And that never ends. There's a scripture, I can't quote scripture, no retentive memory, unfortunately. Paul says somewhere, Something like, are you foolish enough to try to finish with works what God has started with grace? And it's a community that had been raised quite a ways in the early church towards heaven by grace alone and then fell back in, you know, they got healthy enough to do works. So they're like, oh no, now it's works. And Paul, who's standing very close to no self, like totally in heaven, just so ridiculous, no selfishness at all. Like Paul, who's nearly in heaven, is saying, are you foolish enough to try to complete with works what God has begun with grace? And you see it in people, that t that particular stage, you'll, you'll see someone getting just healthy enough to say, I could stop doing this thing I do. I'm very close to stopping, but I won't stop yet. Is that going to stop me from coming in? It's like, well, n n no, because 
in another year, you're not going to do it anymore because God's still pulling you out of it. But if you really could stop, why don't you stop? Start stopping. <laughs> but like you, you know, it's like oh, I think I could start to, you know, it's like the clouds are starting to part. I think there's some sun in my life. Maybe I could choose to have a better day today. Yeah, you probably could now because God's got you in a place where the clouds are parting. But ultimately, it's God just grabbing you, pulling you slowly. And one day, and I know this for sure, it's, I'm watching it happen in people, myself, whatever. It, it, God just slowly pulling you towards infinite light. That's it. It's, it ends in heaven. That's where it ends. And I don't mean when you die. If you complete the journey here, it ends in heaven here. It ends in standing in the glory of God and never not seeing it. And that, that's, um, there's a mystery there that I shouldn't go into, but I'm going to say really quick. There's some things that are weird in the New Testament, weird things, that the whole planet will be transformed by our consciousness. Let, that if we're saved, the planet is saved. There's this strange notion in Christianity that God made the world, but the world's a little bit messed up. We messed it up with our consciousness. And that as we heal, nature will also heal. Uh, I'm not making um, climate change statements. <laughs> I'm not saying anything about anything. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> I don't want to get shot or praise or anything for anything, man. Just, but it's, this, it's deeper than that. It's something else. If Jesus sees you and it brings you to heaven, what happens when you look at a puppy when you're in heaven? Or a child, when you're in heaven. See, then all of a sudden, you're standing in the light. You're seeing with God's light. Now when you see someone, they're walking in the light. That's the trick of salvation. It's inevitable. If you say yes, this is my new word lately, it's inevitable. It, you can't miss if it, it you can't miss if you don't want to you can't i don't think it's possible i, th I think i really think this you can be naive I, um you talk about me now you could be naive um you could be uh mostly naive i think you could be kind of mean I'm talking about me still you know a fighter kind of a you know have all the wrong ideas about things, maybe some bad genes, all Scottish genes. You know, they, I looked up, like, Scottish men. Jill said, I think you're Scottish. Because I was saying I was Irish, but then I remembered my dad actually said we're almost all Scottish. But I liked the Irish better when I heard it because I thought they were tougher, so I went with Irish. That was back when I was 19. So then, then um, I found out, no, mostly Scottish. So, and Jill said, oh, yeah, that fits. And, and, and I thought, well, what do you mean? She's like, well, they're kind of intense. <laughs> so I looked up Scottish man, and it's like the guy said, we're not angry. <laughs> but he's fucking raising his voice, you know. We're intense, but we're not angry. And I'm like, yeah, man, you're really starting to speak my language. <laughs> I mean, I meditate a lot, and I've not mellowed out that much. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't even know why I said that. It's so dumb. But <laughs> the thing is, man, whatever you are, whatever you are, it's God's good creation, and God's going to pull that into union. And and uh, there's a mystery there about how it transforms the whole world and other people and how it preserves your personhood because it's like there's a mess in here but there's also God's good creation in here and Jesus just starts to separate the wheat from the chaff there over time but it it's like getting in a river it, it's not work it's work in the sense you feel it happening and you got to lean in and say yes and that's sometimes all we, it's lucky that's all the work there is to it, because it's about everything you can do sometimes just to say, geez, another round, okay, I'll do it. All right, all right, I'll do another round. Sometimes that's like the 
everything you got just to say, okay, work me over. But it's God that does the healing and the changing. And that's it. Everyone I know that gets this says, and the, a lot of them come from the New Age or other religions, they say, now that I know what this really means, I think everyone would like it. And I do too. I do too. I think people would like it. If they know what it means. The power of it. Oh, this is all totally off topic. It's shouldn't even say it, but I'm going to say it. I was talking to a guy. I, I like this new guy I'm working with. He's, I like his questions, and he's fun. So, but he was asking. He was reading Teresa of Avila, and she's like talking about all this suffering, you know, on the way to God. You know, like what's with the suffering? And it's like, you know, it, Christianity has the same relationship with suffering that Christianity has with sin. You start mentioning that there's right and wrong, and people get nervous. It's just so easy to go to condemnation. So then people start observing their suffering on the way to union with God and they get nervous. I mean, is God producing the suffering and why can't God just be nice about it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what is it with this suffering thing? But I, I think of suffering the same way I think of sin. Look, we're going to walk through this. The trail goes through these bushes and they got thorns and it sucks a little. But there's just no other way to get there except through this place. You know, it's the way it is. Sometimes God, light comes in you so strong and it feels like it hurts and it burns. He said, what is that? And I said, I think it's physics. I think it actually just burns until you're purified. I don't think there's any like intention behind it to make you suffer. It just freaking burns. That's it. But also, you know, the saints talk about all these trials and I invented this idea and then I realized all oh, the contemplatives already knew it. It's one of those reinventing the wheels. And sometimes when you go in your own way, you spend years figuring something out, and like, turns out everyone knows it. <laughs> this is one. But I realize, I'm reading these saints, I'm like, God, they suffer, suffer. Talk about suffering. It's like, geez, man. It kind of could be a downer, talking about the suffering. And they, they say God has these trials they put, that God puts them through, these trials and tests. But, and I started thinking, what could that possibly be? And, you know, and then I'm a ways on the path, so it's happening to me, and I realized they didn't know about psychology back then. They're feeling abandonment surface from their childhood. They're feeling the pain from being sexually abused that they don't even remember being purified out of their soul. There's, there's a ton of psychological transformation going on that really, at that time, they had no language for. They didn't know. It, it makes up the bulk of the suffering is um, emotional healing from unconscious wounds they don't even know they have. And, and remember back then you could kill a kid. I mean, you know, like it was okay to kill your own property. So you've got to imagine the parenting was sometimes quite rough. You know, quite rough, way rougher than us now. So you think, yeah, you start reading their suffering. It's like, well, there's energy going in, feeling like they're on fire. Okay, that hurts, but it that's just what burns out impurities. That's physics. That's something physical happening. And then there's emotional healing happening for wounds they don't know they have. So they hurt. They ache. There's all this pain. And it's being pulled out of them, but they got to feel it on the way out. And they call that trials. <laughs> They had no better language for it. And I came up with that and invented it and then listened to Thomas Keating say it better than I just did. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> okay, that's really it. <laughs>